Arrive. Good morning and happy Easter. And so today we will talk about Easter. And um, I had when we originally did the schedule, which we do like months ago, I had the topic for today: obsession in the spirits movement or in the spiritual center. I was like, no, 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 that cannot be. We forgot that was Easter. So. Uh, I'm glad that we noticed that and we're able to change because actually that's a much nicer topic to talk about. So we're going to talk about Easter and we'll um, of course start by bringing up the meaning of Easter. And traditionally we know that uh, for the Jewish people um, Easter means passage. We can talk about um, the Jewish people leaving Egypt. Um, a state of slavery to a state of freedom and the passage to the Red Sea. So for the Jewish people it means freedom and also means transitioning from a state of being an anonymous uh, people to some uh, a, a society now, organized society, society, a society that had uh, its own identity. For the Christians, more specifically for our brothers who embrace the Catholic faith, um, Easter means the resurrection of Christ. And for us, Spiritists, it's not something that we traditionally um, celebrate, uh, but we certainly share and embrace and celebrate the meanings um, that are in Easter. And of course, you know, if you think about the, what it meant for the Jewish people, I mean, we celebrate and we value the freedom of all people. We also embrace each day in our lives the message of resurrection, which is the message of immortality, which reshapes our entire existence by bringing a completely different set of values and understandings about who we are the purpose of our lives and what the true values are for our lives. Even for the disciples at the time who believe in, Easter, believe in the immortality of uh, the soul, who believe in the continuity of life, the resurrection of Christ came to transform their lives even more deeply because they were able to see, to witness through history, through the, the countings of others, that life went on, but above all, that there was a justice, much higher than the human justice that governed all of our lives. So when we think of spiritism, we think that life is an eternal Easter. And that's how we see, and that's why we don't specifically celebrate Easter as other religions, but Easter is our lives, because Easter is passage. Easter is transformation. So Jesus, when he's resurrected, he brings this transformation, this idea of immortality, this passage from what appeared to be death to true life. And so what life does is precisely that, is life each day is going to invite us to experience small deaths in order to acquire true life. So for spiritists, life is this dynamic transformational process that um, brings a very difficult concept, and we'll talk about this concept, which is the concept of impermanency, and uh, invitation for daily resurrection. So in our lives, Things are constantly changing. I was thinking, I was talking to someone another day about, um, oh, it was this week, this week that um, a friend of mine, when I was, I don't know, 18, 19, found me on Facebook. And it has been so many years since we last spoke. And I was thinking to myself, oh my God, that was another lifetime. So our lives have lives within itself. Our lives, our one life is made of many lives of many times. 
And that's necessary. It's necessary that it is this way because if we are stuck in one moment, in one circumstance, there will be no growth. In order for us to grow, in order for us to reach the state of enlightenment that we're seeking to achieve, it's necessary that things move on. So the only permanent, true permanent thing in our lives is our life itself that never ends. It is our spirit that is immortal. And outside of a life that never ends and a spirit that continues on regardless, everything else is temporary. Life is constantly changing. People come, people go, we arrive, we leave, things come, things go. And every time that we resist the idea of Easter in our lives, of passage, of transformation, we suffer tremendously. So for us to be able to embrace the state of mind of transformation and growth, it's necessary that we start by accepting the idea that nothing, nothing, not even our relationships will be the same. Because we are not the same. We are constantly changing. So it's natural that our relationships will change as well. So life is made of many rites of passage. So when we are first born, that's one major rite of passage from the life of the spirit to the light, the life into the flesh. I would say the most scary one because we dive into unconsciousness and into the unknown of what the incarnation will be like for us. And we leave behind the spiritual world, which is for some of us, some spirits come from a very, very difficult place, but a lot of times we will enjoy some benefits of not being inside this dense flesh. And so it's a very hard transition, but one that we do because we know that by dying the flesh, we will re resurrect one day in a much better position. So just the process of incarnation is a process of transformation. And I don't know if you pay attention to what I said, we die in the flesh. Because for the spirit, the incarnation is like a death. We come into prison. We come to this dense matter that buffers our sense and our consciousness so that we can resurrect tomorrow, we can achieve eternal life in a much greater, hopefully, state of consciousness and of enlightenment. In marriage, right? So when we go into marriage, we do just before we get married this big party, right? To celebrate all the things that we're leaving behind, all the great things about being single. <laughs> it's a rite of passage because we are losing, losing our freedom, our ability to be at home and do whatever we want, whenever we feel like, right? But we do it, we do it because we know that there will be incredible and amazing gains. So we do it because we are seeking to achieve something even greater. Aging, passages, you're a child, you have all the great things about being a child, then you're a teenager and you lose some of the wonderful things about being a child, but now you're gaining some consciousness of yourself, and then you become an adult, and then you come to the age of maturity where, for a lot of us, becomes very painful, very difficult, because now we're losing our ability to do, which we tightly associate to our sense of value, our sense of worth is very much driven for the things that we can do. And we enter a stage of um, being older, né? elderly, where we are losing all these powerful um, abilities that we have in order for us to be, in order for us to prepare to enter the real life in order to help us to detach from all the illusions, such as, I am worth it because I can produce. No, you are worth it, period. And so that's what this 
age, this time in life is going to allow us to do, to understand where our sense of worthiness comes from, where everything is taken from us, our flexibility, our strength, our youth, and then we invited to let all that behind and dive deep into ourselves to find out in our hearts what makes us worth it. Then you have that, it's another passage, another transformation into the real life and every single new opportunity, new person that comes to our life a lot of times allow us a passage, a transformation to a new place, to a new moment. So in Spiritism, when I say that um, it's Easter every day, it is because every single day we invited to transform ourselves, we invited to proactively seek the path of enlightenment and the path of renewal, to do this passage from unconsciousness to consciousness. So I bring this passage from the Romans, from uh, a letter of Paul to the Romans when he says, therefore I urge you brothers and sisters in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So, there are so many other passages and so many other um, ideas that I could bring. But I chose to bring this one when Paul um, tells the Romans and all of us to do not conform to the pattern of this world. Do not conform to the values of this world, right? And so be transformed by the renewing of the mind, by the renewing of the values, by embracing the message that was brought to us by Jesus 2,000 years ago. So this is the invitation, and this, and this is why it's Easter for us if, each day, because each day we are celebrating this message of immortality. And it is from the message of immortality that we, um, that we take our power to be able to overcome our own shadow and our own unconsciousness and move forward towards the light. Why would I choose to change and choose to transform if I did not believe that this transformation can bring a better state of mind and state of spirit and harmony to my life? So when we understand the resurrection, the message of the resurrection, the re message of immortality and who we truly are, we gather from this certainty, from this knowledge, the strength to do our everyday uh, transformation. But it's not easy to transform. I don't know about you, I've been trying to work on some um, areas of my life and personality for a long time, and the progress has been very, very slow. And it's very hard to transform. Even for us, who we know, we heard the message, we believe that we are immortal beings, but perhaps there is the key, we believe it. We don't really know deep in the guts of our body, of our soul, that we are truly immortal. And so even though we have this belief at a certain level, it, it is far from being reflected in our everyday, in our actions, in our choices, and so, part of the reason is that when we are transforming, the process of transformation always calls for letting go of something before you achieve something else. And when we let go of something, it's always painful. And sometimes we can't bear that pain. And when we are talking about spiritual transformation, one of the major problems is that we have heard of the kingdom of heaven, we have heard of these states of peace and bliss, but we don't really know what it is. <laughs> we don't really have the reference. So if I say to myself, 
which I am really doing this. On Monday, I'm going to start a diet. <laughs> I know exactly what I'm going to get if I start a diet on Monday. I know that I can shed maybe five pounds. Let's put it this way, right? So I know exactly what I'm going to get. But when we're talking about giving up all the things that we like and the ways that we are and the ways that we live and the things that we adore, to get what exactly? This kingdom of heaven? And what is that really like? What are those feelings? I know what it is to eat a really good brigadeiro and what that feels like. And if you don't know what brigadeiro is, I'll tell you later. <laughs> I know what that feeling is like. I'm used to that feeling. I know that taste. But the taste of the kingdom of heaven is so far from our experience, it's very difficult to understand what it is. So part of the problem is that in order for me to give up on my brigadeiro, right, and start my diet, I need to know very concretely what I'm going to get and the satisfaction that I'm going to get from sacrificing. And it is a sacrifice because that's not yet, or at least I'm not conscious of any other value. I'm just taking on what Sherry said, because it's hard to speak after psychologists speak. <laughs> so you have to watch your language and how you say things. So in any case, so in this passage here is a very interesting passage because I think it speaks a little bit about this. Um, it's in John and says, Verily, verily, I say unto you that you shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice. You shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turning to joy. A woman, when she's tra travail, I don't know if I'm pronouncing correctly, hath sorrow because her hour has come. But when she's the liver of the child, she remember no more anguish for the joy that a man is born into the world. He's speaking about the pain of giving birth, right? And the sorrow and the pain that goes into that. But all that will be forgotten once the child is born. And so the message is this, all the pains and the sufferings will be forgotten and the world will rejoice and we will rejoice ourselves when we see the accomplishments and we get to experience the gains that come with the transformation. So part of the transformation is to believe that will be worthwhile. To believe that we deserve something better. To believe that where we are is not yet the best that we can get. But we fight the idea of changing tremendously and we really want things to remain the same because where we are is what we know and it's a very comfortable place for us to be. Part of the reason is, as I said, we don't know what's on the other side. Part of the reason we are fearful of changing because it is in a way diving into the unknown. And so we remain stuck. So let me tell you the story of the king and the parrot and then we'll go from there. So there is a king that decides to travel to Africa to buy some exotic animals and different things for uh, his palace. So he goes to Africa, gets to Africa, and sees these amazing, magic, colorful parrots. They were able to capture one parrot while all the other ones fly to the highest trees they could find. The king takes the parrot back to its palace <clears throat> and puts the parrot in a golden cage and feeds the parrot, and all the servants love the parrot, feed the parrot, they treat the parrot super well. Every night, the king sits with the parrot and talks to the parrot for hours. So the parrot, little by little, starts to get used to that life and he starts to like that life. So one day, the king tells the parrot, listen, I'm going back to Africa because I have some business to take care of. Would you like to say something to your brothers and friends' parrots? And the parrot says, Certainly, Majesty, please tell them that I live in a golden cage, that I am loved by your Majesty and all your servants, that you feed me the best food in the kingdom, and that I am happy. 
So the, the king goes back to Africa and gives the parrots precisely the message. Right after the message is delivered, all the parrots start to cry and drop rigid on the ground. The king is surprised and thinks to himself, maybe these parrots are so sad and longing for the parrot that just that I took with me that they all died. Without really understanding what happens, he goes back to his kingdom, to his palace, and when he gets there, he tells the parrot, listen, this is what happened. I gave you a message and all your brothers and friends, they just drop reeds down on the ground. Right after the king told this to the parrot, the parrot dropped rigid on the ground of the cage. So the king's like, what happened? So the king speaks up the parrot very carefully, takes the parrot outside and puts the parrot on the ground. As soon as he lays the parrot on the ground, the parrot opens its eyes and flies to the highest tree possible. And the king looks at the parrot and says, you fool me. Why did you do this? Why did you fly away? He's saying, I'm just following the message that was sent by my brothers and friends, that sometimes it's necessary to die in order to live. <laughs> and so this is a great little story, right? So what happens to us is that most of us choose to stay in our golden cage, believing that this is the best for us and there is no other option or no other life outside of our golden cage. And sometimes the choices that we make to stay are very negative choices. So also for the Brazilians, there is something called the Gabriela syndrome. The Gabriela syndrome, Gabriela was a soap opera in Brazil a long time ago. There was a song and the song says, I was born like this. I grew up like this, I'm going to die like this, okay? So a lot of times that's our stance, a stance of I can't change, I don't want to change. Some people will say, well, that's just my nature, which is really an absurd because can you think of something more transformative than nature itself? It's constantly moving, right? It's constantly transforming. So some people will say, you know, it's just my nature. Some people will say, if it gets better, it will spoil. Golden cage, totally golden cage. The illusion that nothing else can get better, right? Now, the, I think one of the um, kind of extremes of this uh, state of accommodation in, um, in, in places, they are not truly happy places, in places of illusion, is this little story. So there is a man passing by a dog, and a very, very old man is sitting right next to the dog. And um, the dog looks sad, and it's moaning, and making a, like um, a very sad noise. And um, the, the man asks the old man sitting, but what's happening? to the dog and the old man says, well, he's lying on this piece of wood, this piece of wood. And the man said, well, that's it? And he says, well, there's a nail on it. And the old man says, and the, and the man asked the old man, and why doesn't he get up? It's so simple. And the old man says, it hurts enough for him to moan and complain, but not for him to get up and move. And so sometimes that's where we are too, right? We hurt, we know that it's not serving us anymore, but we just can't move <laughs> to a different place in our lives because we are paralyzed a lot of times by fear and by not knowing that there is for sure something better for us out there. Impermanence is taught to us in spiritism. I think these are the two main ways in which we talk about it, the law of destruction in the Spirit's book, that teach us that it's necessary for everything to be reborn and regenerated. What you call destruction is no more than mere transformation that is aimed at renewing and improving living beings. 
Reincarnation is the idea to die, to be born, to be reborn, and to die, and yet to live, and that is the universal law. The law of transformation, the law of renewal. So those two ideas in spiritism tell us that nothing's permanent, things are always changing, things are always moving. Think about the idea of reincarnation. Everything that we believe that we are today won't be there tomorrow. Our gender, our, um, what, what is it? Yes, everything, everything that we identify in this lifetime, our mother, won't be our mother, our sister, won't be our sister, because that's circumstantial, right? We are all immortal beings in a journey, an individual journey. My journey, I can be surrounded by people, but none of these people can walk my journey for me. I have specific needs, I have specific goals, I have a specific task, and so, I am an individual with an individual journey and people come into our lives and they go. I was thinking about this another day. I have here uh, today with me two of my newest friends, Andre and Ney. And I was thinking about how wonderful it is, this friendship. And I was thinking about how many amazing and wonderful friends I had one day in my life who I don't know where they are anymore, and they were truly, truly amazing people. And they are people that I still love and will love forever because the fact that we are no longer in each other's life does not mean that we don't love each other, but it means that life moves forward. It means that some people need to go so other people can come in. Because we are growing, we are learning, and we will need different people in different circumstances in our life, and so we'll be much better and much richer if we can let it go of some to embrace others in our lives. I like this quote from Pastorino um, when he says, reincarnation has, an object, has as an objective the development of inner God in each spirit. However, the spiritual resurrection is the most efficacious way to conquer the self. In each resurrection, which means to leave the shadows to the light of awareness, to overcome ignorance, to acquire experience, the soul takes a step forward towards peace. So he, it's funny how he plays with the words uh, reincarnation and resurrection. This is from Caroline, Caroline Mice, Mace. She talks, consciousness is the ability to release the old and embrace the new with the awareness that all things end at the appropriate time and that all things begin at the appropriate time. This truth is difficult to live because human beings seek stability, the absence of change. And the advice from the Tao, flow with change, not against it. Again, like I said, when we resist the change, we suffer tremendously. In, in addition to the illusion of suffering that comes from letting go, comes the suffering from resisting the natural flow of life. I love this from a Brazilian writer, Mara Quintana. It's a great quote. The boats are safe at the port, but boats are not made to be in ports. Right, Terry? Right. right. <laughs> so we must navigate. It's nice to stop at the port, visit the friends, see the families, right? For all of us who have family in Brazil and elsewhere, it's very nice, but we must navigate. We must seek our own purpose, our own journey, our destination. We're not supposed to be stuck. That's not what life asks from us. So let me <clears throat> start closing up. I posted this on Facebook in Portuguese, so this is my own translation. If there's something a little awkward, please forgive me. Let it go. I give up the sterile stability that prevents me from growing. I am like the rain that one day was a lake, a river, an ocean. I ascended with the warm kiss of the rays of the sun, and today I reign, fertilizing other lives. I give up the rigidity that invites me to be the same all the time. 
I am like the seasons, succeeding one another and populating with flowers, fruits, rain, sun, the ears of the creatures, each thing in its time and place. I give up the dangerous accommodation that brings safety and at the same time crystallize heroic actions that my soul craves to take. I am like the butterfly that takes the risk to break the cocoon and leave. In this case, nature does not offer an invitation, it is an imperative action. My life moves forward happily because I know how to leave one edge to reach the other edge. My life is happy because I know when a time to close a chapter in my life has arrived. My life is happy because I am thankful for everything that arrived and contributed to who I am. And with a peaceful heart, I can say goodbye, opening new space for new experiences. I do not hold things or people who arrive at my life. I only go with them. I let them go when they have accomplished their task next to me, if this is important for them. I do not complain or am afraid of necessary departures. I only recognize that I feel so I can open space for others to arrive. I do not despair with the instance when I feel the pain of a loss or that a transformation brings. I thank God for the good that is the continuous renewal. Therefore, I let it go. I am happy to realize that a moment of construction always comes after one of destruction. I am happy because I am one with life. I am like the water from the rain that recycles itself. The seasons come and go, demolishing or building new scenarios. And the butterfly takes the risk of flying, even though it has spent its entire life tied to the ground. I let it go with reverence, the old in my life to embrace the new. I am happy as well because I'm able to develop in myself a detached way of loving. I am happy, truly, I am happy. Okay, so that would be the first stage for our transformation, is the letting go, right? We don't have much time, so I'm just gonna touch this briefly and we can explore this some other time. But from Calvin Mascarenhas, who um, talks about neurolinguistic and spirituality, there are some steps for the transformation that I think are very uh, interesting. Um, when we choose to change something in our lives, sometimes we start at a very superficial level, which is the level of environment. So we may say something like this, well, I don't wanna be in this place anymore, meaning emotional, spiritual place, so I'm not gonna go to these type of places. Because in these type of places, I'm more inclined to be my old self. It's a very superficial level. All those levels are important levels and they don't have to be in this order necessarily. But it can be a starting point. The second one is a behavior. So a lot of times you say, well, you, you say, I'm not gonna do this behavior anymore. And what we do is you change one behavior for another behavior. So you may say, I'm not gonna smoke anymore, I'm going to chew gum instead, right? Or I'm not gonna eat brigadeiro anymore, I'm gonna run every time I feel like eating a brigadeiro. I'll be running a lot, okay? So you will be um, doing a change in behavior, in your action. You can go a step further and deeper into yourself and start developing some capacities, some strategies. So every time I go to eat my brigadeiro, I'm gonna imagine myself growing a little bigger and I'm doing a visualization, right? A mentalization. So I'm developing a strategy to help with the process of transformation. Then you get to a, a, a much deeper level. You start truly working on your values and your beliefs. So it's not only you doing because um, at the level of behavior and environment, but you're starting to truly, truly believe and know that that's better for you. That's when I think it start gets to the point where giving up on something is no longer a sacrifice because it's no true loss involved. And I think that's what Sherry was referring to. So when it gets to the level of beliefs and values, sometimes um, we see someone who have done the transformation and we inspired and we are driven more so to do the change. And then it gets even deeper because now it's an issue of identity. 
you don't do anymore those things or you don't want to be in the old ways because that's no longer you. You no longer, those type of behaviors and feelings and way of living no longer identifies with who you have become, including your values, including your sense of what's truly good and what truly is going to bring you happiness and peace. So that's a change at the level of identity and then you have the change at the level of spiritual. You start to experience something that this world does not offer to you. It's a spiritual experience. Sometimes the process of transformation can start from the spiritual. Is what happens with Paul of Tarsus, right? So he is on the road of Damascus and he meets with Jesus. So that was a spiritual moment that led to the transformation at all other levels. So it doesn't need to be one way or another. And in closing with our um, talk for this morning, and in speaking of Paul, the goal for each one of us then will be that we don't fear transformation. We don't fear the movement of life, but we embrace the movement of life. With the certainty that there is something better awaiting for us on the, on the other edge of the river. And that we continue courageously, like Sherry says, fear will be there. But what life wants to see is, can we acknowledge fear and still take a step forward? Can we say to ourselves, yes, I'm scared to death, but I must try. Because if we're not able to overcome our fears and take that step forward, we won't get to the other side and we won't find the kingdom of heaven and we won't have the experience that Paul of Tarsus had that led him to say at the very end, ah, the beginning of the sentence is, I was crucified with Christ. I'm no longer the one who lives, but it's Christ who lives with me. So that's the message. So beautiful and it's so perfect to close our talk. I was crucified with Christ. That is the truly meaning of Easter is the crucifixion, let it go, all the earthly things, all the earthly attachments, all the adoration to adore the one that's the truly one to be adored, who is God. And in adoring God, we adore ourselves and we found us in ourselves, as Sherry said in the beginning, the power to transform our lives. Thank you.